Um, all right, today I'm going to talk about mangroves. Uh, thanks for inviting me. I'm really happy to be here. There you go. Um, I want to start with the definition of mangroves. Um, mangroves are considered. Sorry, <laughs> mangroves are considered trees or shrubs, which can flourish in intertidal coastal intertidal zones. This picture is from black mangroves that I took in Mustang Island in Corpus Christi, um, probably six months or one year before the freeze event that wiped out old mangroves in Corpus Christi. But this is pretty much what it looks like in Corpus and all the Texas coast. And the mangroves are distributed worldwide in the tropicals and subtro tropical and subtropical regions ranging from 30 degrees north to 30 degrees south um, globally and locally they are delimited by tides by river flow by nutrient availability and by variations in fresh water inputs pretty much the cold temperature is what it delimits uh, the mangrove forest in the US, we have black mangrove, red mangrove, and white mangrove um, distributed at coast around the, the Gulf Coast. I steal this map from the Nature Conservancy, and this is the actual distribution in 2022, where you can see all the mangroves around the Gulf, and pretty much the most dominant uh, mangrove forests are located in the Florida coast. So we have 54 species of mangroves in 60 family, 16 families. This means that mangroves are taxonomically diverse. Um, pretty much they do not share a common ancestor, but they have evolved, they have evolved um, by having or by developing physiological um, characteristics, very complex physiological characteristics that made may them succeed in the wild. Um, to make genus, it's the Avicinia and Rhizophora, which Rhizophora is best known as the red mangroves, and Avicinia the black mangroves. And I'm going to talk talk a little bit about three, uh, the most common that we have here in the U.S. Rhizophora manglei is the scientific name of the red mangrove. Avicinia germinans, it's the black mangrove, and the Gunkularia rosimosa, it's the white mangrove. And they have developed specific characteristics. Um, depending on their environment. This is pretty common to find in Florida, the mangrove donation, uh, where we have white mangroves near the inland, more less frequent. Um, they have less water influence or less inundations compared to the black mangroves and the red mangroves. Both of them are known by having root structures that make them cope with water and with anoxic soils. Black mangroves are usually found um, with water and dealing with high tides and then very low tides with no water at all. And probably if you have walked through a black mangrove stand, you can see they they have most of the time stinky water. Compared to the red mangroves, they have long roots that help them uh, stick out and breed because they breathe because they are usually inundated. So let's talk, let's go more in detail about what are um, the mangrove adaptations that make them succeed. Um, the first one and the most important is um, they can adapt to the waterlogged soil. This means that most of the times they're leading, deal, dealing with um, anoxic soils and a lot of water. <clears throat> uh, Rhizophora genus or the rice of red mangroves are characterized by having aerial roots um, known as prep roots or stilt roots. These are arm like structures that uh, extend from the main away from the main trunk and they might develop a secondary aerial root, which make them attach to the surface for the substrate and and can if you have many mangroves next to each other attaching to the substrate. Now you have a barrier that can prevent storms and winds to destroy the coast. 
And these um, aerial roots can supply oxygen to the underground uh, roots and to all the plant. Uh, in the aerial roots of Avicennia genus, we have the nematophores, which are shallow horizontal roots that radiate outwards from the main trunk. And every 15 or 30 centimeters, we have this pen pencil-like structures that came out uh, from the soil and from the water to breathe. These are called nematophores. A medium size of mangrove, black mangrove can have up to 10,000 nematophores. And here is a picture of um, the nematophores in black mangrove. And most of the times we can determine how high can be the tide by having these mangroves, how high they have they have grown to be able to breathe when they are completely inundated. I took this picture in South Padre Island. And looking more closer into the nematophore structure, you can see this. Um, Dots, these are called the lenticels. These for this um, little holes allow the oxygen to go in and the carbon dioxide to go out. So if we cut the pneumatophore across, we have this cross section of the pneumatophore where on the outside, this is the external layer called epidermis. And then we have the cross section of a lenticel, which are the tiny pores. Here's where most of the gas exchange takes place. And here, all this area, it's known as the arenchyma tissue, which is a spongy gas-filled tissue that allows all the gas all the gas to travel to the plant and out, in and out of the plant. Another very cool adaptation about mangroves is they can cope with salt, very high salt levels. They do, they do this by having two mechanisms. One is exclusion by preventing the roots to absorb salt through the water and is mostly found in rhizophora mangroves and by secretion, secreting the salt, um, having salt glands that secrete through the leaves. And you can see the little tiny dots, the salt crystals. I took this picture in every, and in any summer hot day, you can see the salt crystals. Um, in addition, a fun fact about Laguna Madre, which one, it's considered one of the most hypersaline um, bodies of water in the world. Um, the regular seawater has around 35 parts per thousand of salinity. South Bay, which you might know, it's really close to Boca Chica Beach, has, in, during the summer, can have up to 85 parts per thousand or more. I remember when I was doing research in Boca Chica Beach, I could measure, I think the highest was 96 parts per thousand, but on average during the summer, you can have this 85 parts per thousand, which is way more compared to the ocean water. Another adaptation are the propagules. It is not a fruit or a seed. It's a seedling structure. It's a living plant attached to the parent plant. This, is, this phenomenon is called viviparous. Vivipary, where the plant still growing while, while it's attached to the parent tree. And this is because they have low levels of hormone abscisic acid. It's best known as ABA acid. And this um, hormone causes the mangrove to prevent dehydration of the sea, stopping the DNA synthesis and the cell division. So by having low levels of this hormone, the mangrove seedling it keeps growing until this is detached from the parent tree. This um, ends up by having another advantage, having the tidal dispersal of propagules, where in rhizophora, this is a seed, um, propagule of red mangrove, and this is um, propagule from black mangrove. Um, propagules swim in the water horizontally for a couple of days, probably a, up to a month, and then they switch to this vertical position where they can attach to the substrate, attach to something, and start rooting. These um, um, they can be transported a lot of distant, long distances, and it's another way to disperse the, the mangroves and colonize other areas. 
The black mangrove can live up to 110 days floating in the water until it's attached to the substrate. And they're pretty cool because they can tolerate high salinity levels once they are attached to the, to the substrate. And most of the plants can really die by having those high salinity levels. On the ecological role and why mangroves are really important is because they are, they are the biodiversity superstars. Mangrove forests provide habitat for 341 threatened species. We're just counting the ones that are in danger or are threatening, and this fact is by the Nature Conservancy. They provide nursery areas for and habitat for fisheries, invertebrates, reptiles, and birds. A lot of spe species sustain from mangroves. They are considered keystone species. That means that they play an very important ecological role on the ecosystem. And if you remove mangroves from the ecosystem, they can collapse the entire ecosystem. A lot of species re rely on this one. And they are considered one of the most productive ecosystems on Earth. Another keystone species includes seagrass and coral reefs, which we also have seagrass in Laguna Madre, and that's a very important ecosystem that we're trying to conserve. According to the South Texas Wildlife Management with Texas Parks and Wildlife, um, mangroves are home of threatened and endangered species. For those um, bear, bear people, we have the peeping plover, the whooping crane, the eastern tern that are endangered, and they are part of the mangroves ecosystem, and of course, the ocelot. You can uh, Google up like South Texas Wildlife Management, and you can see all the species that are um, endangered. I have tons of invertebrates that are also um, endangered that are part of the mangrove ecosystems. And they also pro provide coastal protection and erosion prevention. In this diagram, I can show you how the coast um, have mangroves have an impact with mangroves and without mangroves. Why not having the mangroves can increase the risk of inundation and storms. I have a small video that let me see if I can show you. Which replicates pretty much what we have on mangroves. All right. Can you see it? All right, that was a, uh, an example of a small scale replicate of what is going on with the mangroves and how much it affects to not have mangroves in the coast. They really, really provide shelter for us. Okay, and then they are also a good, one of the most important ecosystems related to blue carbon. Coastal blue carbon is defined as the ecosystem that stores huge quantities of carbon dioxide or carbon in the soil and in the plants. Um, they help us address climate change by removing the greenhouse gases like carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. And salt marshes and seagrasses are also a huge important part of blue carbon. And it's well known that mangroves and salt marshes can remove 10 times more carbon dioxide from the atmosphere than a tropical forest. And even though seagrasses is only 0.1% of the world seafloor, but they store 11% of the ocean's bird carbon. That is, it's really important to conserve these ecosystems by removing them or by destroying deforest doing deforestation in the coastal areas, we're removing more carbon dioxide that is going in directly into the atmosphere. 
it's it, it is also really important for the economy in 2018. NOAA said that commercial and recreational fisheries supported 1.7 million jobs and contributed to 238 billion in sales. Having healthy ecosystems also provides good quality of goods and services, including the food and the recreational activities. In addition, they are a good source for water purification. I know in Asia, it's a really good source for wood, for honey, for medicines. It also prevents erosion worldwide, recreation, recreation, education, and of course, research. However, we have lost 35% of our mangroves since 1970s, and they are currently disappearing 1% to 2% annually. The major trait for mangroves are humans by doing aquaculture and urbanization. Climate change also plays a huge role. Oil spills and eutrophicated waters. Eutrophicated waters means having more nutrients, more pollution near coastal areas. I want to talk a little bit more on nutrient enrichment. This was part of my thesis research. And one of the things that we know about uh, nutrient enrichment in mangroves is the effects that they have is having higher above ground growth compared to root growth. Since they don't have to look for the nutrients, they don't have to extend their root system. They have the nutrients right there. So they don't develop a strong root system and that makes them less resilient to storms. That means if they have, if we have a hurricane or a strong storms that can wipe out the mangroves really fast because they are not attached to the substrate strong enough. From there, we also have less below ground, car below ground carbon allocation that also produce soil erosion. And we have seen a shift in coastal vegetation um, by having a, dominant, a dominance of different species. In the physiological level, we have that nutrient retention capacity is also affected. Part of my discussion and the main things that we found out is that black mangroves reduces salt marsh vegetation cover and diversity under nutrient enrichment. We did the nutrient enrichment by fertilizing the mangroves with nitrogen and phosphorus, and the effects were that we have in more mangroves, more biomass of mangroves that is covering and dominating the salt marsh vegetation. This will create a shift where salt marsh starts to disappear and we have an areas completely dominated by mangroves. This also affects the soil accretion and the wildlife habitat and, of course, the carbon storage. Uh, the main thing that we find out is mangroves are highly adaptable uh, to their responses in nutrient availability by having high growth rates and by reducing the nutrient use efficiency, by reducing how they metabolize the nutrients. They can respond pretty quickly to those changes. So another question that are a good trending topic for research right now is that mangroves are invasive. Since mangroves are expanding from the tropics towards the poles due to having more warmer winters, we see that, for example, Corpus Christi freeze event in 2018 that wiped out all the mangroves from Corpus Christi. Where probably 10, 15 years ago, we didn't have, we didn't even have mangroves in Corpus. Uh, mangroves are expanding more uh, north and south by having less uh, or more warmer winters. Um, there is evidence that they can produce a shift in vegetation um, from salt marsh to complete mangrove dominated. We need more research on that and see how that will affect in the future. Ecosystem dynamics also can be affected. That means that it can affect the Another species, including uh, invertebrates or fish, uh, it can change the hydrology of an entire ecosystem by having by not having salt marsh, um, and also the soil accretion or soil erosion <clears throat> can be affected. This will lead to more future research opportunities. I wanted to attach this short video on climate change that would explain how everything is connected.
to coastal environments. We are connected to the ocean. And, and this video will show you how with our everyday actions, we're affecting these ecosystems. As a result of the industrial revolution that kicked off in the mid 1700s, the Earth's surface is warming up at a never seen before rate. A major reason for the rise in temperatures is the increase in the concentration of greenhouse gases in the Earth's atmosphere. These cause our planet to retain heat from the sun. Greenhouse gases such as carbon dioxide and methane are released into the atmosphere when fossil fuels are burned. Trees and oceans absorb carbon dioxide, but can't handle the large amounts that are now building up in the Earth's atmosphere. And because our forests are shrinking, even less carbon dioxide is absorbed. The high levels of carbon dioxide are already acidifying oceans, killing off coral reefs. It's also triggering a dangerous rise in sea levels and an increase in extreme weather events. Around the world and across Europe, Innovators are now racing against the clock to invent new ways to live in our cities, use land, manufacture products, and run our businesses. New innovations are bringing down greenhouse gas emissions to confront climate change and its threat to our health and our economies, while creating new sustainable growth and jobs. Join us at Climate Kick. All right, now you might be wondering, how can I help to conserve marine and coastal ecosystems? And I think the first step is to be aware of your ecological or carbon footprint. What is that? That means that how many resources to analyze and know how many resources are you using in your lifestyle and how much of that the earth can sustain. Is it the same amount that we're taking out that the earth can compensate and can build up? Or we're taking more that we that the earth can sustain and can provide. And that's the ecological carbon footprint. And I want to show you this quick video. It explains this really way and really well, and I hope you can understand it. You know you should probably reduce it, but what exactly is your carbon footprint? Carbon footprint refers to the total amount of greenhouse gases released into the Earth's atmosphere as a result of the activities of an individual or an organization. Remember, greenhouse gases trap heat inside the atmosphere, and that's overheating the planet. So if you want to work out your own carbon footprint, you need to know the amount of greenhouse gases like carbon dioxide you're responsible for creating. It's a difficult thing to measure precisely, and there are different definitions about how best to calculate it. But roughly speaking, there's the direct impact of using energy when we travel or to power our homes. And there's the indirect impact of the energy that's used to create all the things we use or consume. In the developed world in particular, transport is a big part of your carbon footprint. Cutting down on the use of petrol or diesel cars and taking fewer flights is one of the most effective ways of reducing it. The place you live also contributes to your personal footprint. It's important to make sure your home is heated or cooled efficiently and is well insulated. The more you can use sustainable energy like solar or wind power, the more you cut your emissions. The stuff you use at home also adds to the problem. All that plastic, metal and cardboard takes a lot of energy to produce and dispose of. So recycling can help reducing your carbon footprint, but not as much as how you travel or heat and cool your home. Then there's your diet. Above all, red meat makes your carbon footprint bigger because cows produce so much methane, another greenhouse gas, and huge numbers of trees are cut down to create pastures on which cattle can graze. In the developing world, polluting stoves are a real problem too, so it's important to try to replace them with more efficient methods of cooking. But overall, people in poorer countries produce far smaller amounts of greenhouse gases than people in richer countries do. So if you look at just what a country produces, the average amount of carbon dioxide emissions per person in the United States is about 16.1 tonnes per year. 
In China, it's 7.1 tonnes. And in the UK, it's about 5.5 tonnes. In the Democratic Republic of Congo, it's only 0.03 tonnes. While in Qatar, which has a really small population, but produces so much oil and gas, it's 38.6 tonnes. Now, that's just production. It doesn't take account of all the other things we've talked about, how much you consume. But obviously, the more money you have, the more you tend to consume. So if people in richer countries really want to reduce their carbon footprint, they need to make huge changes in their lifestyles. It can be done. And new technologies to make things greener are coming on stream all the time. But it is a reminder that the declared aim in many countries of going carbon neutral by the middle of this century means a revolution in the way we live. All right. Now I want to share um, quick tips on how we can reduce that um, carbon footprint and develop or start or start to develop a more sustainable lifestyle. Number one, reduce the water your water consumption. Number two, invest in energy star appliances appliances that are more updated and can. And car and can use less energy. Three, it's a big no, no for single use plastics. Not anymore. We don't need those. Uh, four, recycle right away. Wash your can, dry cans, containers before tossing them in the recycle bin so they can be later on can be recyclable. Also, number five, upcycle. Um, reuse, um, for example, the teachers that can can become today's cleaning rags. Your old t-shirts can become um, a cleaning rag. Number six, reduce your waste. Uh, most of our food consumption, like I, I think it's estimated that 40% of all food is wasted in the US. Number seven, eat local whenever possible. Doesn't mean that you go to local restaurants, but also you eat at home and you uh, cook your own foods. Eight, eat more meatless meals more um, plant-based diet, number nine, shop smarter, smarter. Uh, number 10, try less or carpool whenever possible. Uh, growing your own veggies, that's also a huge, have a huge impact um, on your sustainable lifestyle. Educate and share. It is really, really important that any tips or any practices work that we're doing, we share it with or family and friends and try to make this a new culture. I have additional resources for you um, in case you're interested. You can calculate your ecological footprint. There is tons of web, page, web pages or websites um, that you can go access for free and calculate your ecological footprint. This is one um, pretty use friendly footprint network .org. I did it earlier today and I just kind of like clicked through it and went fast and it ended up to be that I use 3.9 herds and that's kind of like how how many herds do I need if I keep this lifestyle. Uh, I'm not proud of that and kind of it, it's not exactly accurate, but it's 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 scary, almost four herds. And I think it's the average in the US per person is 11 tons and mine was 60 tons. No, I mean, the average is 60 tons and I was just in 11 tons of carbon dioxide. I was producing 11 tons of carbon dioxide. So it, it, it's a pretty cool web page. You can explore the facts and figures and, and more solutions and more tips. I can spend hours and hours sharing more tips on how to be more sustainable. That's a completely other topic. I just wanted to make to be aware of how our everyday actions have a huge impact in conserving our coastal and marine environments. This is another one where you can calculate your water footprint. How much water do you use? And you can have an estimate on how many gallons per day you use. It's also pretty scary, but I encourage you to go out and check it. Uh, it's watercalculator.org. Um, there's also a lot of websites that you can um, visit, try to do it, um, understand 
your lifestyle and share it with your family and friends um, and be aware of what we are consuming. Another additional research resources that I have for Netflix, these two documentaries are great. It's a must, you should go watch them and they're pretty, pretty good. Very insightful, very, they kind of like plays the reality pretty cruel, but I, I think it's worth watching. <clears throat> Another site, um, it's man gear. Every purchase that you do for outdoors, like shirts, caps, accessories, glasses, sunglasses, you they will plant one mangrove. So buy one, plant one. It's a pretty cool, I have mine. And they are uh, based in Florida, so they're restoring a lot of mangrove ecosystems on in Florida. Another one um, for those that are really familiar with iNaturalist, GBIF, it's pretty much the same, but more scientifically oriented where you can look up one species and you can have a map of where is distributed. You, have, you can have pictures, um, you can have publications on that species. So it's pretty, pretty good, pretty interesting. It's for free, you can also access that on the website. And that's it. Thank you very much. Thanks for staying with me. I hope you enjoy it. Uh, there's a question online that says, what happened to the mangroves in Corpus Christi? I think it was in 2018 where we had that freeze event that killed most of the mangroves in Corpus Christi. It was damaged also in South Padre Island, but not as bad as in Corpus Christi. So the question is, how did you get interested in mangroves? Hmm. Oh, good question. Um, I started my master's in 2019 and when i applied to grad school i wasn't sure of if i was going to if i wanted to go completely marine biology or going wildlife biology um and i talked to dr Farrow, which it was my advisor and i started learning about mangroves he had that opportunity and i i fall in love with the mangroves and all the history i started reading a lot my mangrove experiment was already established by a Smithsonian environmental researcher. Her name is Candy Feather. And she pretty much replicated the same experiment around the world. And it was pretty cool because she wanted to replicate that same experiment in Brownsville, in Boca Chica Beach. So I had a lot of resources where to read out and how to and understand the effects that mangrove and the nutrient pollution has on mangroves in very, very different parts of the world. Uh, she had experiments in Australia and Brazil, Florida, Costa Rica. So it was it was pretty, pretty interesting for me. And I immersed myself in the world of mangroves and I love them. Okay, two more questions from online. Um, are mangroves protected? As far as I know, I'm not in Texas. They are not protected in Texas, but I know there's a law or regulations in Florida, regulation in Florida where you cannot destroy the mangrove. You have to get a special permits to con to destroy mangroves and build infrastructure. And the same case is in Mexico too, because Mexico, I think it's probably like 90% of the coast in Mexico is dominated by mangroves. Okay. Thank you. Um, do you know the depth of animal interaction with the black mangroves? It is, mangroves are considered a keystone species, so it's really, really important. There are few species that are named, for example, for example, the mangrove snapper is a species of fish that it's endemic from the mangrove ecosystem. Um, I think there's a bird, if I recall correctly, uh, there are different uh, crabs, mangrove crab also. Um, so there are a lot of species that depends on the mangrove ecosystem and have, you can only find them there. But it's really, how, really extensive. How does SpaceX affect the mangroves at Boca Chica? Thank you, Javi. Mangrove yellow warbler, that's the name of the bird. Um, so SpaceX, I... My research site was across the SpaceX 
and pretty much I got there before SpaceX and I saw the, the transition of having more infrastructure in a very well habitat. Um, I think mangroves have survived the explosion so far, but they have not survived people going inside the refuge to pick up the rocket debris and Pretty much at the beginning, as SpaceX was driving on top of the mangroves to not get stuck in the mud and destroying the mangroves. Uh, I think they destroyed like four or five mangroves out of the 40 that I have for my research. So I those are the ones that were part of my research. There were more that were destroyed by, by SpaceX. I know US Fish and Wildlife, um, Talk to SpaceX and kind of like change and limit the way they can go inside the refuge um, to just, I think they, they are allowed to go in walking only or something like that. So they're not allowed to go in with vehicles or ATVs um, that have a, that can destroy the ecosystem down in Boca Chica. And I think they are releasing contaminated water. I'm not sure on that one, but I, I heard that they have um, problems with um, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Texas Parks by releasing contaminated water near Boca Chica. Helena, when you mention uh, Boca Chica Beach, um, are you referring to like the South Bay area or over toward the river? I know both areas have mangrove and and I know South Bay, South Bay is considered uh, extremely threatened and uh, and at, is at extreme risk from SpaceX and its uh, and its events and uh, catastrophes. The small ones they've had and the big one that might happen. Yes, um, my research site was just at the end of Highway Four, um, close to South Bay. All of that area is managed by U.S. Fish and Wildlife, so it is considered a federally protected area. But I guess the SpaceX has been getting permits from there from them to cooperate and protect and do like that environmental assessment that they have to do and see how they have how they are changing the vegetation over time. Next question is, what is the average size, height, and width of a single mature mangrove plant? Well, that's a really hard one. <clears throat> For example, the mangroves in Boca Chica can have the same age that the ones in the Burden Center. But since the mangroves in Boca Chica ha are dealing with more salty environments, they are not growing that fast or that high compared to the ones close to the Laguna Madre. So salinity plays an important role on the, the stature of the mangroves. That's why most of those are shrub forests, pretty short because they're dealing with more salt. Um, also, mangroves don't have rings. Once you do a cross section of the main trunk, Mangroves do not have rings, so it's really hard to estimate the age of a mangrove. Um, so that, yeah, that varies a lot. But I think the ones in Boca Chica are probably like 25, 35 years old. Okay, everybody really enjoyed your presentation. Thank you very much. Thanks to you. I'm really happy to be here.